This morning we're going to be in Acts chapter 2, verses 42 through 47 again in this series called Living Upside Down. And as a refresher, the, last week I asked the question, how did they get from Acts 1, a small band of 12, then later in that chapter about 120 had kind of a little more bravely gathered? How did we go from there to Acts 17 about 20 years later? to the point where the local leaders 1,500 miles away are saying, these are the people that have turned the world upside down. How do we do that? And again, we're not looking for principles so that we can write a book and have a bestseller of the five ways to church growth or anything like that. But I think there's some things that we can learn. And I, I, I contend as someone who's grown up in the church as a pastor's kid and, a, and, and all of that, I think I've seen the church that I love in America, the church as a whole, drift off course in, in some of these things. I think if we're honest, we've seen that too. Um, one, if you recall, uh, I had kind of three big things that I said I think the church got right. I think they had a, a, a healthy focus upward, and that's the teaching of the word. That's prayer. Uh, a healthy focus of who God is. They had a healthy focus inward fellowship breaking bread together that was we'll talk about that next week that was the lord's supper and a, a common love feast of gathering okay it's kind of like the hippie movement of the 60s and 70s sanctified right and so but they also had a healthy focus outward and that that flowed out of the joy that they had as a group and it just couldn't help but just explode out so we're going to look at some of this today this Focus upward, inward, and outward. But it's amazing, um, when we talk about church growth, it's amazing what some pastors, what some church leaders will do to grow the church. Let me give you a few examples. There's a church in Kentucky that had a big, big Sunday morning service, more aimed at, at, at men, but it doesn't have to be. They fed everybody a nice steak dinner. That's, that's a cost, right? Nice steak dinner, and they gave away guns as door prizes. <laughs> hey, it worked. Had a lot of people come. It probably would work well in Alaska, pretty sure. But another pastor in Ohio transformed the entire church into uh, a bull ring. Brought in a big bull named Bone Crusher. And for about three seconds, so he didn't last the eight seconds, but about three seconds, he rode that bull and then got thrown violently off and dusted himself off, went up and preached a sermon for 45 minutes. But people came. I think my favorite is there's actually hundreds, and do a Google search on this, there's hundreds of churches in America that are doing uh, MMA fights, mixed martial arts fights in the church as a way of, so I guess turning the other cheek has a different meaning there. <laughs> hit me here, then hit me here. I guess that's the thing. And then I'll hit you back in the name of the Lord, right? That's it. That's it. So beating each other up in the name of Jesus, right? You know, th these tactics might draw in crowds momentarily, but that's, is that how you grow a church? It's not how you grow a church. Maybe numbers for a while, but not in depth, not in maturity. Now, the opposite is true also. If a church isn't growing, it's probably dying. It's probably shrinking and, and dying. In 2019, this is a year before the pandemic. Many churches have closed their doors since the pandemic. This is before. 3,000 new churches were planted in America that year. We go, yes, that's exciting. Same year, 4,500 churches in America closed their doors permanently. That's a net loss of 1,500 churches. <laughs> a new pastor at a struggling church in Kansas spent his first several days, he's so excited, visiting all kinds of people. Hey, he'd like to have you come back to church. This is a small, struggling church, and exciting things are happening. Spent the whole first week just visiting everybody. He was so excited. Sunday rolls around, basically an empty sanctuary. Him and his family and maybe one other person. He was so discouraged, so he said, I'm going to try something different. He put a notice in the paper that this little church that had been faithful all these years is now dying and we're going to have a proper Christian burial. We're going to have a funeral come this next Sunday. He advertised it on radio, all kinds of things. So the following week, man, out of probably morbid curiosity, people came and it was overflowing to capacity. They were peeking in the windows and what's happening here and everything and 
And up front, there's just a simple casket with some flowers. And everybody's curious. And he does a proper eulogy for the church talking about its history and its glory days and all these things. And then uh, he says, we're going to line up and you can come and visit the casket and give your respects. And when you come up to the casket, you're going to see who is responsible for the death of this church. And as they come up one by one, they leave in guilt and shame. Because within the casket, you know where it's going. I see nodding heads. At the proper angle was a mirror. Where they go up and they say, oh, ouch. Now, I'm not giving that indictment across country church this morning but i'm just saying it, it maybe if we're not growing we are we are in the in the process of shrinking back and dying so we ha- but we want to have a healthy perspective of church growth we want to have a biblical perspective of what it means to be growing as a church so last year we talked about the teaching of the word or last last year last week we talked about the teaching of the word from acts chapter 2 verse 42 because there was four things that the early church was doing right after 3,000 people through the work of the Holy Spirit came to believe and join the church, the first mega church in history. Acts 2.42 says they were devoted constantly to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So last, last week, we talked about the teaching of the word. My big idea was the spirit of God leads the people of God to submit to the word of God. And that was evident in what they did. Today, we're going to look at fellowship. Fellowship. Now, as someone, I, you may not have grown up in, in church. I did. And to me, fellowship was the fellowship hall. It's where you went after church for weird casseroles and stale cookies and maybe some Kool-Aid to wash it all down. That was the fellowship hall, right? And they'd announce it. And some of you know what I'm talking about. They'd announce it on on Sundays or whatever and say, hey, we're going to have time in the fellowship hall. It was like a scheduled event, right? Two hours of fellowship. And then at the end, you kind of go your own way. Is that, is that a biblical idea of fellowship when we see that here? I don't I, I don't think so. Or you have people, you could do a Google search for all kinds of fellowships. There's like fellowship, almost like a brotherhood. There's fellowships of different bikers and they go do things. There's, there's, uh, you know, fellowships of, of welders and all kinds, whatever. There's common purpose and a common passion. There's a fellowship. People are gathered around that and are excited about that. I think that's more in line with what we're talking about when we see fellowship here. It's not stale cookies and bad coffee. Okay, it's, it's got to be more than that. The Greek word here for fellowship is koinonia, koinonia. And translators over the years have really scratched their heads because there really is not one English word that sums up that entire concept. There's not an equivalent of, you know, this word means that and we're, it, there, it means much. And that's what I want to dive in this morning. I think for context, we can look at a few verses. We can look at one in Acts, and we're going to dive elsewhere, too. If we look at Acts chapter 2, they, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, breaking of bread, and prayers. And then I think it goes a little deeper as to what that means. All came upon every soul, verse 43. Many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. That's proving the power of the Holy Spirit at work. Verse 44, here's key. All who believed were together and had all things in common. That word common in the Greek is a, is the word koinos, which is like koinonia. It's the same idea. They had, they had fellowship. So they had a common thing. So there was But again, does that give us a definition to have all things in common? A little bit, but let's go a little deeper. Romans chapter 15, you can turn there if you want. Chapter 15, verse 26. What's happening here is Paul is writing his his letter to the church at Rome and uh, thanking some other congregations for giving to the saints in Jerusalem because the church in Jerusalem was very poor. They were heavily persecuted. They didn't have any money. And in chapter 15, verse 26 of Romans, he says, For Macedonia 
and Achaia, these are other congregations, have been pleased to make some contribution for the poor among the saints at Jerusalem. That word contribution is the same word, koinonia, fellowship. And are like, wait a minute, is this now about money? Now think about it. If you're a church that has any kind of funds at all, and you say, you know, there's this upstart church over here in this other area, they're barely making it, they need our help, let's send them a contribution. What are you doing? You have a common sharing, a common goal, a common purpose, a common passion of, I see what they're trying to do, it's God's work in the church, and we're going to give to that, so we're coming together in that, okay? So it's in that there's a sharing of need. There's a sharing of need. So fellowship has that as an aspect. There's a sharing of togetherness. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. You can write these down and look at them later or go there now. 2 Corinthians 6, 14. Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? So how, what can we learn about fellowship from that? What, how can fellowship bring together light and dark? That's what it's said. Those are polar opposite things, right? But if you have light in a room, do you have darkness? No, it's not there. If you have darkness, like pitch black, middle of winter, Alaska, at night, darkness, do you have light? No, you don't. So I believe what Paul's saying here is the idea of a common unity and living life together, you can't be, I'm over here, oh, but I'm over here. Does that make sense? If, if I'm light and Stephen is light, then we're going to have fellowship. But if I'm light and someone else is living in darkness or just going different ways in life spiritually, we can't have fellowship. So fellowship is not only a sharing of need. We see that from contribution. Fellowship is also a unity, a unity of, of who we are in our essence, our spiritual DNA, our core. There has to be a unity there. Philippians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. This is Paul. It's a beautiful, it's one of my, if you can have favorite books of the Bible, it's one of my favorite. I love the book of Philippians. Um, Paul's writing to the church at Philippi, and he says, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Always, that's Paul's language. It's just always in this big, you know, every prayer, always, all of you. Always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership. That's the word koinonia in the gospel from the first day until now. So, so far it's, it's translated as contribution. Same word. Fellowship. And now partnership. So what is he getting at here? I think it's, it's the same idea. He, he planted the church in Philippi. And now he's somewhere else planting more churches and he writes to them and he says, we have a common goal, which is the gospel, the truth, being spoken to a lost word. So we have fellowship. So not only is fellowship a sharing of need, fellowship is a unity of essential spiritual essence, but it's also a joint participation. It's, it's, it's doing things together. So to, it's having a common purpose, but also it's acting out that purpose together, whether that's serving in some way, whether that's, um, you know, whatever that is, it's, it's together. It's, it's Rebecca leading VBS and us coming alongside as a church and saying we're going to do that together, right? That, that's the idea here is a fellowship there. Philemon chapter 1, verse 4 and 6. This is Paul writing to a, a brother in, in the faith, Philemon. He says, I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the saints. And I pray 
that the sharing of your faith, that word sharing is koinonia, same word, may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. Now, there's a lot there to unpack, but if we t- think about that word, the sharing of your faith, I, in context, it seems to be talking about Philemon going around and blabbering to everyone about this gospel, this Jesus, he can't stop. He's just telling everybody, and Paul's like, I, I commend you for that. Well done. It's, it's So involved in fellowship there is a communication. Does that make sense? It's not always just a coming together and eating a meal and being inward. It also flows outward from that. From that, that oneness. So if we kind of recap, we say, well, fellowship is sharing needs. It's living life together in a way that, that I know your needs. You tell me your needs. I tell you my needs. There's a vulnerability there, and, and we help meet those needs. It's a unity of essence. It's being about the same thing. Right? It's having the same orientation, spiritual. And then it's a joint participation. It's, it's doing together. It's serving together. And then finally, it's just a communication. It's, it just kind of filters through how we talk, what we talk about. If you're in a fellowship of a motorcycle club, and I'm not a motorcycle guy, I've always been intrigued by them, but just never uh, it really had the money to buy one. And so... That, that kind of held me back. But for me, it's, it's fellowship of chainsaw club because I'm a chainsaw now. So if I'm going to have a fellowship of, a, of some kind of a chainsaw club, you know we're going to talk about chainsaws. We're going to communicate about that a lot, right? And sawdust and, and you know, what, what brand of saw do you use and all those kinds of things. That's going to be in our, in our conversation. And also it's going to be in our, in our, in our activities. We're going to have joint participation. We're going to go cut trees together. We're going to go cut stuff, right? We're going to sharpen saws and do all that kind of thing. We're going to have an, an outward service towards each other. Okay. We're in, and, and we're going to have kind of a, 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 a an essential essence. I can, I can know within a minute or so whether you're a real chainsaw person or you're one of those fake lumberjacks that wears the flannel and tight pants and all that <laughs> like no good try but we don't have an essential essence of of who we are you're kind of faking it right mm-hmm. and then finally back to the top the, the contribution if you can't afford a chainsaw i might not buy one for you but i might help in that and go hey i can give you a little bit because i want you to have a a steel or, or you know, a, a, a steel, you know, a, a proper brand of chainsaw, not not anything that's that won't won't cut it. Pun intended. Okay. So, so what's the big idea about fellowship? This is what I have. Fellowship is social activity with the purpose of spiritual maturity. Fellowship is social activity, and that can be all kinds of stuff with the purpose of spiritual maturity, to grow, to grow one another, to grow one another in good works, as Paul says in in Timothy, right? To spur one another to good works, to grow in the faith. But it's social activity with the purpose of spiritual maturity. So that's what fellowship is. Why? Why do we do it? Well, the need for it, I think it's always been part of God's plan. For humanity, he knows, he created us, he knows how we're wired. It is not good, he says right at the beginning in Genesis, it's not good for man to be alone. Yeah, in context, it's talking about a husband and wife, but it's really all just talking about both. Right? We, man needs a wife, wife needs a husband. There's a bothness, we need fellowship. I think what we see in the New Testament church in terms of fellowship is a New Testament picture of an Old Testament principle. There's an Old Testament truth here, and we're seeing that lived out. They needed each other, just like Adam and Eve needed each other back in Genesis. So we should fellowship because God knows we need it. We can't survive without it. We can't thrive without it. But also there's a growing persecution happening. If you look at Acts chapter 2, verse 12 and 13, so Peter's... You know, all of a sudden, we've got the coming of the Holy Spirit. We've got the speaking in strange tongues and languages. And in verse 12, they all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? Like, 
what is all this language stuff that we're here? Why are we hearing all these funny things? Verse 13, but others mocking said they're filled with new wine. They're drunk. They're like, man, it's not even nine o'clock and these guys are drunk. That's what it is. They're writing it off. So that's a mockingness, but that mockingness, if left unchecked, will grow into full-on persecution. Are we seeing that today? Increasingly, just look at our culture. We're being isolated out of the public square of debate and, and communication and politics. We're being marginalized increasingly if you're a person of faith. We're being canceled, whatever word you would put there. Increasingly, if you are a believer and if you are a devoted follower of Christ, you're, the, you're a hater. You're anti. Get, get out. This is where culture is going, right? And there's a mocking tone to anyone who would walk along the path of the Christian worldview. Same thing here. So because persecution was coming at them, and because it was beginning, <clears throat> I think God knew because people are not to operate in isolation. People are not designed to be islands to themselves. We've got to have one of them, especially when the world is lying against you. Even more so. <laughs> I think persecution is its own poison. It's a different kind of persecution that they faced then that we're facing now. But believers throughout the world today are facing a similar persecution. And it's a poison. And the antidote to that poison is fellowship. It's a refuge. When you're beat up and, man, my, my family doesn't understand me. I, I, I'm trying to do this according to the Bible and they don't get it. So a family get-togethers and holidays. It's just this strife all the time. And you feel like beat up and battered. Where do I go that's a refuge? Fellowship with other believers. That's why Jesus said that family members will turn against each other, right? That is just going to happen because some are going to follow and some are going to say, you're a Jesus Bible thumper. I'm good. I'm, I'm over here. They're not going to get it. Uh, 2016, I had the opportunity to go to Myanmar. Um, <clears throat> what, what we used to call Burma. And we had worked with uh, many uh, Burmese refugees living in Kansas City for many years, and I was invited to go to their home country to do a couple weeks of training and teaching in different villages. It was the experience of a life. I took our oldest uh, child, Josiah, with me. He was 14 at the time. And, uh, and, and a group of pastors in Kansas City went with me. So we go and we do, I mean, the things that I saw, I'll, I'll have as memories the rest of my life. I think the biggest memory um, that I have is going to this village and we're, and we're going out to this remote village and, and uh, I was told by the hosts, the Burmese uh, hosts that lived there, <clears throat> and they spoke English and they spoke the national language, Burmese, and they spoke their own uh, language of their people which was uh, Karini, but they didn't speak the language of the people we were going to, the village, which is the Karin language. So the whole seven-hour jerky bus ride there, I'm like, okay, I'm sitting next to them, I'm like, okay, tell me again, who's going to translate? Like, what's, how's this going to, and they're like, don't worry about it, don't worry about it. And so I'm like, okay, and I have my notes that are all in English, and I don't know their languages, and so maybe an hour later we're talking, like, Okay, so about that translation, um, you know, I'm getting more and more nervous. So we finally get there, and uh, we stay overnight in this hotel because we got there late. And the next morning, we're at the village at like 7 in the morning. And there's like hundreds of people at this tiny little church, and, and they're all Buddhists. Um, and so they're, but they're waiting to hear this white guy because they've never seen white people or Americans, uh, you know, in their, in their country. And so they're all lined up ready to go. And I've got my notes, which are in English, and they speak Korean, and my translator doesn't. So I'm just increasingly like, Lord, I don't, I don't speak in tongues. You haven't, this is not Pentecost. I can't do this again, right? And so I'm so nervous. And then all of a sudden, this guy comes walking up to me, Burmese man, comes up and he shakes my hand, because they don't shake hands like we do. 
They have a different way of, of they'll hold their hand like this and do it as a, as a sign of respect. Many Asian cultures do that. And he comes up and he, he's going to grab my hand like he's just an American, right? And I'm like, what is happening? And he comes up and he starts speaking fluent English. And so I'm like, okay, who, are, like I'm thinking, you're a Burmese angel. <laughs> I don't know what you are. And so, but he starts speaking. I said, who are you? And I found out his name was Nelson, a Burmese person named Nelson. He was named after Admiral Lord Nelson of the British uh, military years ago. And he speaks fluent English. He had learned it years ago when he was in the military. And he interacted with British uh, and American troops many decades earlier. I said, well, how do you keep fresh with the language? He's like, I, sometimes I will meet a British person here or there, and I'll just spend some hours with them and, and, and refresh my, my knowledge. I said, well, do you, I said, can you translate? He's like, yeah, I, I just happened to be here. He didn't know we were going to be flat. He just happened to be there visiting some family. I said, we're going to be here for two days. Can you translate? So I would gladly translate. So we're talking all day. I will gladly translate for you. It's an opportunity to speak English. He's Buddhist. He wasn't a believer. And so I said, now, final thing. Can you, because oftentimes translators struggle with slang, idioms, things like that. I said, can you handle American slang? He's like, oh, I, I, got, I think he even said, I got you. I'm like, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's legit. We'll do that. So where's that story going? Those entire two days. Now, not our translator. The translator allowed me to speak to the Burmese leaders that were believers. Because our, our host could speak English, but the pastor of this little church, no English. It allowed me to speak to this pastor and his family. It allowed the pastor and his family to speak to me. And we sat there for two days when we weren't teaching. And we ate together. And fellowship together. We had everything. Do you understand? There was a common purpose. There was a common sharing. They brought goat to eat, uh, boiled bamboo and different things that I hadn't eaten before. I didn't have anything to give. I would have given whatever. But at the end, we were able to give some money to them. We were able to give a contribution to the work there. So there was a fellowship. I think it's the most beautiful picture that I, that I can think of of fellowship. People of different languages and cultures, but there is a common purpose and a common passion, and that flowed out to a common goal of, of what we're after. I think that's fellowship. That's more an, and what fellowship is than a time in the fellowship hall or a scheduled event and things like that. So why we fellowship and we need it. We need it persecution, mockery, whatever, just rough life. When life hits you, we've got to be together to get through those difficult times. How we fellowship. Acts 2.46. I think this is very fascinating. Acts 2, verse 46. And day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. How we fellowship, I see two things here. I see a big gathering and a small gathering. I see that they were at the temple. So in the, in the time of, the, of this early church, King Herod had expanded the temple so that the temple mount area, the kind of like gathering courtyard area, outside of the inner temple was about 36 acres. So this is a seven acre property. 36 acres would be pretty big. So it would easily allow all of the common, uh, you know, gathering of Jewish people, plus that 3,000 that just got saved and they're now followers of this, you know, Jesus guy, right? It could allow them to just kind of be there and gather. There's different areas. There was Solomon's porch. There was different areas where they could gather and have a time of worship, a public gathering of worship. So they did that often. And they were stirring things up because of that. But also that extended, that bled over to a house-to-house -house gathering. So they would, it's like they would have this big kind of worship time and this wonderful time of praising God and understanding 
that Jesus is God and all these wonderful truths. And then they're like, oh, oh, we're going to go to Gino's house next. All right. Everybody, you know, not everybody would go to Gino's, but 10, 20 people would go there. 10 would go to Ginger, whatever. It's like, we just break up and go, let's keep this going. Now they had jobs. They had to go do life, right? But a big part of that daily and weekly life was gathering together house to house as much as was possible. Because again, if persecution is coming, if they're feeling the thumb of not only Rome, but now the Jewish leaders on them, man, they're going to need each other. We're going to need to go to Geno's. I need to tell you what happened. This one Jewish, whatever, and I might be in trouble. Pray for me. And then we're going to eat together. And then it would, it would just go from house to house. It would just keep going. So how, what can we take from that? How do we apply that? Well, I think we, if we're not careful, we can be legalistic and go, well, you need to come Sunday morning and Sunday night is kind of more the small group, the dedicated few. That's how it was growing up with me, right? You just If you're really a Christian, if you really love Jesus, you come on Sunday night as well. And so then there's that thing. And then Wednesday night, don't forget Wednesday night, Thursday night, we're going to go visit people. All these things is like, boom, legalism, legalism, right? Tack it on. We've got to do this. I don't sense any, any spirit of legalism here. This was voluntary. They weren't, it wasn't a program to say, in order to really love Jesus, you need to sell all your things and give it to the poor, right? Now, Jesus had said that to the rich young ruler, but that was a different reason. That rich young ruler had a God and the God was money. So that's different. This was a voluntary, hey, the shrimplins have need. I could probably sell an extra whatever and meet their need. It was totally voluntary, right? And so it was a voluntary gathering in people's houses. But it was essential too. Because again, life is hard. Life is difficult. Sometimes life is grimy and messy. And when we open up our houses to each other, we allow that mess and griminess in. And yet God uses that to encourage, to show love one to another, to, to renew our spirits. So there's some differences here, I think. In a big gathering, if, if, if I'm up here preaching or Gary or Stephen or Jonathan, we're sharing truth, right? The small gathering... You are sharing truth. And you're like, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not a preacher. I, I got scripture to back this up. Okay. First Corinthians 14, 26. If you would take a moment, if you have a Bible, turn there. First Corinthians 14, 26. And if you don't, write it down and chew on this later today. In this whole section of chapter 14, he's talking about what to do when you gather for worship. And again, this was in the home, because at this point, there was such persecution, there was no public gathering happening, especially in places like Corinth, where they were feeling this cultural push against them. So this is in homes. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, men and women, when you come together, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. I want to read this again. What then shall we say, brothers and sisters, when you come together for a time of gathering, worship, in the home, each of you has a hymn or a word of instruction. A revelation, a tongue, or interpretation. Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. Now, there's some stuff there where we go, is speaking in tongues for today and things like that. Let's not get weighted down in that. Let's find the spirit of what's happening here. I think the spirit of what's happening in here is if we gather house to house as believers, then Ginger has something to say that can speak into my life. Or she might say, can we start singing a song? Because she's a musical person. And we can sing and worship that way. 
Or Mary Lou might say, you know, this thing happened the other day and I want to share this as a way of encouragement. Or someone like Abigail, even the young. Paul says to the Timothy, to Timothy, don't let them despise you because of your youth. Abigail might say, you know, I'm really struggling in this, in this area. And we gather and we pray for her. So it's different than the big gathering. The big gathering is, I may be speaking. Stephen is leading in a time of congregational worship, right? So it's more of a spectator. It's up here and it's more of a, of a spectation in that way. But a small gathering, it's participation. It's everybody. Now, you might say, well, I don't have anything to share. Just soak it all in. Enjoy. Be encouraged. Smile, laugh, eat food, right? Fellowship. Just have a commonality there. Um, some thoughts I had. The big gathering, we worship together. We learn from the word together. In the small gathering, we walk together. We do life together. We apply the word together. I really think an application of the word comes when we're in small groups. And it doesn't have to be in your house. It could be when you're out on the butte like a group of people were yesterday and they're just enjoying God's creation and I wasn't there. I don't know if like spiritual conversations happened, but I guarantee you this, it's God's people gathering, enjoying his creation. Together, they were worshiping. Right? Right? So that's the idea of the small gathering. And I did hear of some encouraging things, some encouraging conversations that were happening. And so I think, I think that's the type of thing that they did often. It doesn't always have to look like a church service. If you have a small gathering in your house, it doesn't have to be, well, prayer, opening song, 30 minutes of message. No, it could be five minutes of a, of a hey, this is a nugget of something that God's been doing in my life. It could be an hour of eating. And laughing. Yes. <laughs> and just enjoying life. And I think that's what they did often. In fact, we know they did because early non-Christian historians talk about this crazy love feast cult called, it's called the Agape Feast. This love feast people, they're just going around and laughing and acting like they're drunk all the time, even though they weren't. They're having such a joyful time. It's like you sit and eat. And you have so much joy. Right? And the world didn't understand it. Well, it's like, what is this? Strange thing. That's living life upside down. So, why we fellowship? We need it. We talked about what fellowship is. How we fellowship, I really think it's essential to have a big gathering and some type of small gathering. Even if you're just doing it on your own. And, and it's not anything that's legalistic where it's like, man, that's just one more church thing i got to commit to. Now, let it flow from your spirit of that. I want that. I need that. Next Sunday, we're going to start. We decided we've been praying about this for a while. We're going to start gathering in our house right over here at the parsonage every Sunday evening. It's not a Sunday night church. Okay. It's a Sunday night gathering of the church. If you can make it great. If you can't, don't feel like if you're off doing whatever, enjoying your hiking, your fishing, whatever you're doing in that evening, go do it. But if you want to gather, we're going to gather. We're going to eat. That's going to be a lot of it. We're going to laugh. We're going to say stupid things because it's going to be humans there, right? So we're going to say whatever. It's going to be a fun time. And there's going to be a time where we just let each other, 1 Corinthians 14, 26, come together and just see what the Spirit of God does. So we're going to do that starting next, next Sunday. And all of you are welcome, even if you don't bring food. Hey, but if you bring food, we're going to like you even more, okay? Well, we'll send out details about that, but that is something we want to start doing. as just a way to say, let's gather. And, but here's the application for that. Do that on your own. Whatever that looks like. Fellowship. Um, there's this great theological debate. Um, Charcoal or gas? <laughs> when you grip, right? And if it's dry out, electric, obviously, is the only answer. Of, of, of. But I I'm personally am a charcoal person. It just takes time. I get it. But man, you get such heat in front of Gary's like, no way. It's like the gas ain't gone, right? Yeah, that's efficient for sure. But man, there's just something about that charcoal heat. But if you ever 
lit charcoal, piled charcoal, got them growing, they're glowing and turning white on the edges. And if you were to take tongs, not your hand, tongs, <laughs> and separate one of those for a time, yeah, eventually, quicker than if it's with the pile, it's going to go out. But if you let it stay in that center and in that pile, in that heat, what's going to happen? It's going to continue to burn with a fervency and a passion of my job right now is to get hot and burn and get this food, right? The same is true with believers. If we isolate ourselves and can take us out of fellowship with one another, or when we're in fellowship and we have those barriers and those walls, sometimes for good reason. We've been hurt. There's been abuse. I'm, I'm not sidestepping those things. But if we start to let down those walls a little bit and those barriers and build trust with one another, God heals in that and our charcoal, the briquette, starts to really take off. But if we separate, we're out. We get cold. Everybody else is over here burning, hot, and going, and we're over here. I think it's an interesting illustration for that. My, resp- my, my, uh, I think anytime the word is presented, we should uh, we should have a time of response. Um, and I would say this: uh, I think this is on my heart right now. If you are out of fellowship with any believer in your life, whether something they did to you or whether you did something to them, then. I think now's the time to ask forgiveness for that and to seek forgiveness from that person today or this week. Because if we're honest, there's often times when we've broken fellowship and uh, we need to make that right. And the other response would be, if God is stirring in you some kind of Hey, I really want to dive deeper in, in a, and, and with other people in my house, with other people out on the hiking trail, whatever that is, and just start that. Start gathering with other believers and be the church. Because I'm convinced that if we, if we truly live upside down in that way, because that goes against culture. Gary and I were talking about inviting people in homes. He said, that's not really in the last week. Hey, guess what? That's not a Kansas culture. I think that's increasingly just not an American thing. But how do we live upside down and go, I, and everybody wants an invitation to a meal, if they're honest, Woo-hoo! right? <laughs> so just start doing that. Shaking up your community a little bit, your circle of influence and going, man, something different about this. Okay,